Welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media. This is the show where every single week I bring to you a recruitment owner, a supplier, an investor, a thought leader in the industry who prepared to give up some of their time to effectively talk about their story, how they've built um, recruitment agencies of scale and growth, and also give their insights into what they believe the future of our industry looks like post-pandemic. Today, I'm super excited to be joined on LinkedIn Live by what I would say the the most famous or well-known person in our industry today. Um, Someone who not many people, when I've actually spoken about, know made his fortunes, if you like, in the recruitment sector. Um, Most people know this person from Dragon's Den, a hit TV show back in the UK. Um, And... uh, Someone I've I've met a few years ago at an event in Manchester. I don't know if you remember that, James, where we organized something together. Um, you were peppered by everyone else in the room and got five minutes with me at the end. Um, but I, uh, I'm delighted to have James Khan, CB, on the show. So, James, welcome to the RAG podcast. Welcome. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are in the world. That's it. Well, we are live on LinkedIn, <laughs> and hopefully we've got people from all sorts of regions, and uh, we'll definitely be having people listen back on the podcast or so James um thank you thanks for taking the time out you're obviously a very busy guy and um you know there's a lot going on at the moment in the in the world never mind in, in your situation so thanks for taking the time out my um my look I mean it, it might be a ridiculous question for you but I always ask my guests please could you give us an overarching introduction to who you are and what you do right now um so James Khan started my career in the recruitment industry um, launching a company called Alexander Man, and that successfully followed a stint on the BBC show Dragon's Den, mm-hmm. uh, which was an incredible journey in my life and, and a real amazing experience, uh, which was then followed uh, by writing uh, my autobiography, which was a really good experience. Uh, I then wrote the book Start Your Own Business in Seven Days, And then another book called Get the Job You Really Want for the Recruitment Industry. Um, That was a lot of success. And then I stepped down from business and joined the government to launch a company called Startup Loans to help entrepreneurs in the UK start their own business. Mm -hmm. Um, I did that for three years and launched 28,000 new businesses for the UK economy, which today employ just over 100,000 people. Um, And when my period of that ended after three years um i came back to my day job which is really backing successful people in the recruitment industry who want to start their own business and so what do i do today my day job really is coaching and mentoring entrepreneurs in the recruitment industry who have the passion to build and scale something they can call their own Mm -hmm. amazing okay well let's always i always like to go back I'd like to go back to the start. So 1985, according to your LinkedIn profile, is the year that Alexander Mann was started. So I was I was in the womb at that point. I was born in 1986. So depending on the month you started, I, you know, potentially wasn't even even a, an organism. But how did you get into the sector? So, you know, like I said, not many people, whenever I talk to people about you, that, especially the guys outside of recruitment, right? Everyone in recruitment seems to know. But when I talk to my family and friends, you know, I'm interviewing James Khan, people are like, why? Like, They've got no idea that recruitment is how you made your money. So how did you get into the sector? Um, So like a lot of people, I started working in a recruitment agency as a recruitment consultant. And after a relatively short stint, realized that I loved the business and I loved the sector. And I suppose like a lot of people felt I'd love to do this for myself and sat at my kitchen table thinking if I was going to start my own business, you know, what would it be called? Mm -hmm. and I came up with the name Alexander Mann, which I was very proud of. Um, And Where did that come from? I I love the name Alexander. Um, I think it's a very powerful name. Mm -hmm. Um, Mann, because when you have such a long first name, you need to follow it with a short name. In fact, I just had a son last year, and I called him Alexander, Um, you know, in tribute to Alexander Mann. Um, So I created the brand, created the name, and like a lot of people, didn't have a lot of money when I started. Mm -hmm. Uh, The world was very different in those days in terms of raising capital. There was no venture capital. There was no crowdfunding. Banks 
typically weren't interested in lending money um, to a startup, especially when you've got no assets. Um, so I effectively drew money off my credit card and, you know, walked up and down Pall Mall because in my head, I thought if I'm going to set up a recruitment agency, the location uh, is really important because in those days, people, your candidates came to see you for an interview and your clients mm -hmm. came to see you. Uh, and in my head, Pall Mall was the most luxurious location I identified with. So I literally went from one end of the road, just knocked on every door and said, you don't by any chance have an office you can rent me. Went to one end and then came down the other end. And one of the buildings, the lady said, actually, we do have um, an office we can rent you. What's your budget? Uh, and I said, I can afford £100 a week. Uh, so she took me to the broom cupboard on the sixth floor. And it really was a broom cupboard. I mean, you literally had a tiny desk, no windows. Yeah. There was a desk, a chair, a phone, and that was it. Um, so when I launched the business, it was me, the phone, and the desk. And the most important thing was the Bible, the yellow pages. Um, and that's how Alexander Mann was born. Wow. The, I mean, of all the people I've interviewed on this show, I think most people did a, a, a similar thing where they – you know, they went to a, either their bedroom or a ridiculously small office with no windows. There, there's never any windows in these offices. Um, <laughs> not many knocked on doors to find it. I think uh, <laughs> the interesting thing now is like, you know, that, I mean, it was already probably at a similar position last year, but post COVID, you know, I, I can't, are people even thinking about offices anymore? Like, it's just crazy how different the world is. Um, so how did, how did that business grow, James? It started off with just you in that office. Can you give us like an overarching, you know, how was the first five years, if you like, of, of the initial days? Because most of the people listening to this show are in the early days of growth, right? They're a couple of years in. So what, what was your initial journey like as a, as a founder? Um, I think the one thing I remember is that everything I did was all about taking baby steps. Um, and it really was like building a house and you build it brick by brick. Um, you know, if you'd met me in month one and said to me, James, you know, what is your ambition in life? Then I would have said to you with a smile, you know, if I, to me, success, what does success look like? Success looks like if I could make enough money to move to an office with a window, then I know I've arrived. Mm -hmm. And then three months later, if you'd met me and said, you know, you've got the office with a window, what does success look like? I would have said, you know, if I am make enough money to hire one person, because right now it's a bit of a lonely life. I come to work on my own. And when I when something good happens, I have nobody to talk to. So if I, if I could hire one person, then to me, that was success. And then that went from one person to five to 10 to 50 to 100. And then if you'd said to me, what does success look like? I said, you know, if I could turn over a million pounds a year, then I know I've arrived. And I remember when we first achieved that million pound turnover, it felt great. But that doesn't mean you make any money. No. So even with a million turnover... We didn't make a lot of money. So the next goal was, could I make a million profit? So that was the next goal. So we made a million profit. And I remember sitting down talking to my accountant, feeling I'm super successful because we made a million pound profit. You know, do we have any cash? And he said, no. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's weird, isn't it? You can make a million pound profit, but it doesn't mean you have cash because most of the profit is tied up in your debtors. And because we had a contract book, we were funding contractors with the cash. What so, industries did you recruit back then? Financial services. Financial services. Um, predominantly investment banking, insurance and pensions. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized that actually a million profit still didn't do it. Uh, so the next goal was not just to make a million profit, but to have a million pounds in the bank. So right. could we have a million pounds? So, you know, at each step of the journey, you know, it was an office with a window to hire one person, to hire 10, to hire 20, et cetera. So I never, I never thought that, you know, I'm going to build the biggest recruitment company in the world. I never thought the company would become, you know, the size or the scale, because the truth of the matter is you don't really know. So the one thing no. I believe in is you set yourself goals and objectives that you can touch and feel and believe in because they become achievable. Okay. So each step that I set was something I could identify with and I knew I could achieve. 
you know, so having turned over a million, I thought, right, you know, I now need to scale it to make a million profit. Now I need to scale this to have cash. And then, you know, I need to build a management team. So the business is not just about me. I've got to grow something. And then it's your first, you know, international office, then the second, then the third. So all the way, and it took me 17 years uh, from coming up with the idea to successfully selling the company to a Boston-based private equity firm. Mm-hmm. Were you were you surrounded by entrepreneurs originally? When you like, did you have people to lean on? Did you have mentors? People like you are to your portfolio now. Did you surround yourself with certain people that had already been through the, the sort of trodden the path to growth while you were doing this? No. So as I was kind of growing up in the life of an entrepreneur, uh, my mentor was my dad. So my dad ran his own business, and he was the person that I would always go to because he was the one person I always knew would tell me what I didn't want to hear. Um, You know, and if I had got it wrong, he would not hesitate to tell me. Um, And I think sometimes you can surround yourself with people, but, you know, and sometimes people tell you what you want to hear. And I was very conscious that I needed to have somebody um, because I'd never done this before. This was all you remember. Can you remember something he told you that put you put you on your back and thought, "Yeah, he's right." Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I remember him sharing with me was the concept that in recruitment, you know, we do transactions, but transactions don't build businesses. It's relationships. So he constantly reminded me was not to focus on the transaction, but to focus on the relationship. Because the deeper the relationship with your client, the longer term business you have with them. Yeah. And sometimes as salespeople, we become very transaction orientated. And therefore, he was very conscious that if you're going to build in a business of scale, you need long term revenue, you need predictable revenue, you need repeatable revenue. And that has more value than the transaction alone. And it was almost constantly reminded me of not just be obsessed with today. But what is your relationship with that client? What are you going to do with them tomorrow? Because sometimes I'd get really excited because I'd place somebody and it was a transaction. But he'd always remind me, you know, what is the relationship like with the client? What are you doing to build the relationship? And, you know, the kind of philosophy of business was very much around not kind of vertical growth, but horizontal growth. So, you know, become a trusted supplier to that client. You don't just have to place the discipline that you're dealing with but why can't you place hr why can't you place sales and marketing if you have the relationship and they trust you you want to provide a service across the board to that client so i think is that, that, how, alexander, is that how alexander man grew then was it a, yeah. about getting clients and thinking horizontally about every different business unit you've got we will then have a team that can cater for you yeah, yeah. which is kind of what it does today yeah, makes sense. And was there anything you particularly did, you think, when it came to relationship building that you don't think others did that made you stand out? Um, I think, you know, just as soon as we place somebody, um, I think the natural instinct is you then go to the next one. Okay, so I've done that. Pick up the phone, find the next client. But it was very much a case of staying in touch with the candidate, you know, after one month, three months, six months, nine months. And retain a long-term relationship with him because through him created and opened many doors you know so every transaction to me led to a relationship and he then opened another door for me within that client you know he referred me to somebody that he knew and the thing that i suppose we were very good at was understanding that the value of a recommendation sometimes is worth more than the transaction itself Mm -hmm. So if somebody's prepared to refer or recommend me, you know, in the organization to another department head, to another manager, to another function, you know, the value of that actually could be worth more than the transaction itself. So it's constantly being obsessed with developing contacts and relationships and getting recommendations. It's, It's funny because I know when I say I'm speaking to people like you, you know, People are expecting some secret source, some some something you're going to know that others don't, and it is just 
really simple stuff done well, isn't it? It's just execute the basics really, really well. That's what every successful recruitment owner I've met has only ever said that. You just get it, get the basics right. Um, in it's terms of... Interesting. Uh, I mean, let me just pick up on that. So I remember when we, the business was doing really well and we used to run events all over the country. And I remember at the time there was an individual in was a, an executive search headhunter, which back in, um, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, you know, he was billing at the time just over a million pounds a year, mm -hmm. which, you know, we're bearing in mind salaries were a lot lower. That was a big, yeah, big well. number. And we invited him to address uh, an audience where he gave a speech. And exactly what you said, I sat there thinking, you know, he's going to share these pearls of wisdom about his, you know, how does he bill? You know, when the average person in those days might have been billing 80,000 a year or 100, he was billing 10 times that number. And I, you know, sat with bated breath, hanging on to his every word. And, you know, his key message was, pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I'm thinking, you know, really, I, I was expecting this, you know, this kind of massive words of wisdom. But he just said, you know, I've been doing this a long time. And if I have to reflect back on my career and say, what do I do well? He said, I remember every single day I've got to pick up the phone because it doesn't matter how good you are, how successful you are, you've got to pick up the phone and you've got to find new opportunities, develop relationships. And he said, what is it we don't do enough of today? We don't pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, the most basic, but the truth of the matter is 30 years later, if I walk into a conventional recruitment agency today, you know, what are they not doing? Sometimes I walk into agencies now and you think you're walking into a library. Yeah, I know. It's quiet. I'm interrupting this episode of the RAG podcast to bring you a message from our sponsor, Audro. You know by now that Audro are the number one video interview platform for recruiters around the world. Now, they keep bringing out new features from Audro Capture to Audro Producer, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. But now, recently, they've just announced a new feature to the platform, which is a complete game changer. During COVID-19, they realized that the recruitment audience, the communication was changing. Globally, their clients and candidates were, were using Microsoft Teams and Zoom more than anything else. The phrase, let's jump on a Zoom call or jump on a Teams call, has actually replaced the, the words video interview for a lot of their conversations over the last six months. Now, they were thinking, do we... I mean, how are we going to eradicate this? How are we going to make Audro the name that everyone talks about for, for the interview process? And they realized they didn't need to. They needed to integrate. So for the first time ever, they, they're the first video interview platform on the planet that have decided and managed to integrate with Zoom and soon to be integrated with Microsoft Teams. So with one click, after recording a Zoom video, you can now drag that into Audro and create everything else that Audro has from adding the CV, the heat maps, the capture, and the producer elements. You get all the benefits of Audro before and after the interview, but you get to use Zoom, which is client-friendly on all levels. So this is massive. Teams is coming. It's the first time anyone's ever done it in our sector, and it is literally going to change the way you work in 2021. Get in touch with my friends over at Audro at audro.co.uk, or if you're already a user, reach out to your account manager to make sure you've got this feature. Back to the show. I think that sometimes gets misconstrued with the, the message that I've got, which is, I mean, my business is all built around personal branding, marketing for recruitment businesses. And, you know, I don't believe you, you should change your activity on the phone. I just believe there's other techniques like LinkedIn, like investment in content that can support you. It can, it can mean that your conversations are slightly further down the line rather than the introduction to, you know, hiring managers get in touch with, with, with briefs or inbound candidates that have seen you for a number of months talking about things. And there's still the one ingredient I talk about with personal branding is consistency. It's about, you've got to do it every day. Like it doesn't, you can't just do it. You can't do one great post a week and hope that you suddenly build a brand. And the best way to explain that to recruitment owners or recruiters in general is to relay that back to the phone. You know, how many calls do you need? You know, the more you make, the more calls you make, the more successful you are. And it is, it's always been that way. It always will. Um, so one, one thing about your journey, especially Alexander Mann, you talked about you're always looking at the next step. You were never too focused on the end game. You were just focused on the next logical hurdle along the, along the line. One, one area that seems to 
I, I, I think my portfolio of contacts seems to struggle with is getting past that sort of 30 to 50 man business where perhaps they, they start to infiltrate that, that leadership layer. They're no longer themselves responsible for, for recruiting. But so many businesses don't get through that, Mark, James. They don't push on. And what? how did you get through that from 30 to 50 upwards um, into the hundreds uh, as a business owner? I think the key to that is having a strong management team. So I remember when I was at that stage of growth myself and I was like everybody else. I'd get to 30 and then 30 would become 25. I'd get to 35 and it'd become 30 because the reason was always because we were very thinly spread as a management team. So I think if you're going to scale, you've got to have strength within your management team that shares that vision that shares that future that wants to be on that journey with you so you know the more strength you've got a management the more people that you have who can lead the business who can absorb growth so you know for the sake of argument you know if there's five of you and you can all run 20 people each you're at 100 people so for me, the, the kind of the light bulb moment was recognizing that I can't do this on my own. It can't be the James Khan show because that really is only a 30 man business. But I need to either develop people within or I need to bring people from external, you know, into senior management positions that could help me grow. So I think what unleashes that potential is developing that management team. It's the management team and the strength and the capability that allows you to grow, you know, from 50 to 100 to 200 to 500, you know, the stronger the management team, the more scalable the management team, the bigger the business becomes. If the management team is a bit thin on the ground, I, it's probably just you, it's never going to happen because you can't physically do that. You don't, there's not just not enough hours in the day. And recruitment, we don't make widgets, we don't make cars. It's a pure people-based business. And therefore, it's people that you need to accelerate the growth. Why do you think so many don't want to let go? Why do they hold on to that baby and, and they don't get to that point where they, they, they allow others to take over so many key areas of their company? Because I think by nature, the DNA of people in our industry, we're control freaks. You know, we love to control. We love to, you know, make every single decision. And because we start off very small, there's always that fear of this is my baby. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's probably, you know, not having the confidence um, of having to let go. I think the key is, for me, if you have the right people who have the right capabilities, you're, you find the confidence to do it. So... When I look back on my career, you know, at times when I didn't do it, it's not because I didn't want to do it. I just didn't have the right people to do it with. So the key for me was ensuring that I was constantly recruiting quality talent around me who could take on that responsibility. So yeah, I, I think, remember in that event in Manchester, you talked about this quite a lot. You thought, I think, did you say you always had eight people in the, that you were talking yeah. to at the time? So always, tell us more about that. Like, how did you work that out? So I think the key, it, we go back to a comment I made, you know, recruitment is about people and growing a recruitment business is about attracting people. And one of the businesses that I founded, a business called Humana International, uh, we had 147 offices in 30 countries. So for 10 years of my life, I literally spent on a plane traveling the world. And we had offices from Brazil to Argentina to Malaysia, Singapore, Germany, France, all over the world. And every country I visited and every office I visited, you know, the key management would always say the same thing to me. And I'd say, what is the biggest challenge you're facing? They'd always say, we can't attract good people. So whether you're in Singapore or Malaysia or Hong Kong, it was the same everywhere. Attracting good people is why we exist as a business. If it was easy to find good people, there would be no recruitment agencies. True. And therefore, understandably, finding good people for us is the same. But I always used to find it weird that we seem to be really good at finding good people for other 
businesses, but we can't find good people for ourselves. And I realized that for me, it was never a big issue because unlike other businesses or other competitors, I don't recruit what I call event-led, which mm -hmm. means I don't recruit after Christmas. I don't recruit at Easter. I don't recruit at the beginning of the financial year. I don't recruit after the summer. You know, I'm recruiting 52 weeks of the year. So every single week, there is part of my week that is allocated to mapping the market and identifying potential people for my business. And I set that up 30 years ago. And to this day, because it's a habit now, I do it religiously. You know, I will have, on average, eight people that I'm talking to every month of the year. Because what that tells me is when I need somebody, I don't recruit the best of a bad bunch. I recruit, you know, from a select group of people that I've been nurturing, in some cases for three months, six months, nine months. We hired somebody last year, and I've been talking to this guy for two and a half years. And I reached out to him uh, on LinkedIn. We had a conversation. Uh, I met him for coffee, and we've just stayed in touch. And every now and then, he sends me a WhatsApp. We have a chat. We have a catch up. And because I didn't have anything specific, I never pitched him. But the minute the opportunity arose, I called somebody that actually already had a good dialogue with me and said, you know, John, I'm reaching out because I've got something I want to share with you. This is what we're doing. This is the vision. This is the opportunity. I'd love to talk to you about it. And we'd already built this good rapport. And it was a very easy conversation. Mm -hmm. Introduced him to the management team. And within three weeks, we'd made him an offer and he'd accepted. So the point being, I've always got a constant yeah. pipeline of people so that when I need, I'm not desperate. And I don't think it matters what scale or size your business is. If we accept the principle that growth equals people in recruitment, if you're going to grow and scale, it means you have to attract more people. And if that is the, the ingredient of growth, then you can't not have enough. Yeah, that's true. I like it. So how did the exit plan come along? How, how did that all start? The, I mean, £260 million pound sale is incredible. Where did that process begin? Was it something you chose to go and do? Did it come, were you approached? How did it all happen? Um, I think like a lot of owners, you start realizing that actually, if you can build these businesses really successfully, I mean, they actually are worth a lot of money. You know, mm -hmm. that there are um, private equity trade buys that really value a brand and value the business that you've got. And although I never set the business up with ever thinking that I would ever sell it, but once you realize the value of the business and you recognize that actually a successful exit means you probably don't have to work for the rest of your life, it's quite a tempting, you know, idea. And when I sold the business, I was 42. Um, you know, so to be given an opportunity at the age of 42, where you probably don't ever have to work again, for me, was just, you know, too big an opportunity to miss. And even though at the time, if you'd asked me the question, what are you actually going to do if you sell it? I really genuinely didn't have a clue because I'd never thought that far. Because if I'm no. really honest, I was never that sure it was going to happen anyway. Yeah. So there's no point planning something that may never happen. So like everything else I've done in my life, I was only focused on the event itself. And I kind of kept saying to myself, if it happens, I'll cross the bridge. And of course it did happen. What was I the size have... of the business at the time? Um, we probably had about 700 people. Um, I mean, it was a, a, a decent sized business you know, mm -hmm. pretty big um, international offices in various countries around the world. Um, I had an amazing management team, fantastic infrastructure. The brand had really developed well. It was very well known in the market. Um, you know, I remember waking up on a Monday, having sold the business, watching daytime TV, you know, calling everybody I knew um, because I thought maybe I'll go and play golf or go and have lunch. But of course, everybody's working. And, you know, nobody to play with. 
Um, did you did you literally walk out? You they didn't lock you in for a number of years to earn your earn your way out of it. Yeah, so I sold the first stake in '99. Right. Um, so it was an exit over three years. Um, so you kind of sell kind of stage one, stage two, and then stage three. I effectively um, sold the balance, and then I effectively exited the business. How did it feel? Uh, like, take us back to that moment. How did you actually feel? Weird. When- really really weird and it, the truth is it didn't actually feel anything like i thought it would everyone um, says it, everyone tells you know, me it felt that. strange because you kind of wake up and you think you know what am i actually going to do and you know although you've made some money and you know but the company had been successful for many many years so i you know already had a nice house my kids went to a good school you know so it wasn't what was really going to change i and no. interesting enough, even 10 years after selling the business, still lived in the same home, mm. um, still drove the same car. So nothing really changed. Um, so in a way, if I'm truly honest, you know, it wasn't the big crescendo moment. I mean, I think on the day when we signed and we went home, we went out for dinner to celebrate, it was fantastic, you know, like, yes. But then, you know, Monday when you wake up, so right, what am I going to do now? Uh, and actually, I didn't know because um, it wasn't like I was 70. You know, I was still relatively young. Yeah. And I remember sitting on my kitchen table thinking, you know, what shall I do? And I actually started writing my CV, thought, you know, I'll put my CV out. I'll go and talk to some private equity or I wasn't really sure what to do. Mm. But the process of actually writing my CV, you know, I stopped when it said kind of education and I paused because I reflected back and remembered that I'd left school at 16. And for most of my professional career, I was always a little bit embarrassed when people used to say to me, what university did you go to? And what did you study at uni? And I didn't even do my A-levels. I didn't even do my GCSEs. I left school at 16. The minute they said you can leave, I left. Because at the time, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to run my own business. And I'd convince myself, then what do I need GCSEs for? What do I need A-levels? Why do I need a degree if I know what I want? And therefore, let me go now. And then, you know, obviously I was relatively young at 16, didn't really know. And deep down in my heart, I always regretted not finishing my education. And, you know, here I was with two daughters myself, lecturing them on the importance of education and go to university. So at the age of 42... I decided to go back to school. I thought maybe I should finish, you know, the education I should have had and went to Harvard Business School and, wow. you know, tried to understand, you know, fill in some missing blanks on my educational life. And that then led me to the concept of private equity because I didn't even know the existence of private equity. Why would I? I was in recruitment. Exactly. But when I was at Harvard, you know, that was the buzzword at the time. In, the early 2000s, everybody was making fortunes in private equity. They were investing in Facebook and Google and the private equity industry had exploded. And everybody on my course, you know, were all kind of talking about that was the key buzzword. So when I came back, I kind of decided that maybe rather than setting up another recruitment business, why don't I set up a private equity firm? And rather than starting another recruitment business, I'd like to invest in recruitment businesses and almost do what Advent did for me when they bought my business. They invested, and and the business did phenomenally well. And, you know, as a private equity firm, you know, I sold to Advent, who then sold to Graphite, who then sold to New Mountain Capital, who sold to the Canadian Pension Fund. So Alex Not a Man has been sold four times, you know, since I started when I sold the business. And every time the next guy has doubled his money. So, I mean, you know, today the company's worth probably over a billion dollars. Wow. And, you know, so I could see how the model works. Um, so I started a firm called Hamilton Bradshaw, which is effectively my private equity firm. But the difference was that Hamilton Bradshaw has no external investors. We have no institutional capital. It's just my money. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of from the sale of Humana International and Alexander Mann, I created Hamilton Bradshaw, and Hamilton Bradshaw now it invests in other recruitment businesses. What was Humana again? Was that 
Was that a private equity business or was that? No, Humana was an executive search company. It was a headhunting firm. Um, and that was a search firm that I started from scratch that we built to 147 offices in 30 countries. That was so after Alexander Mann? Alexander Mann, yeah. Yeah, so when you were finishing doing the Harvard Business School, you, you, you did get back into recruitment. Yeah, and then I think you had a chap on your program, Tim Cook. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Humana was a startup in search, and at the same time, I invested in an existing recruitment business called Eden Brown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew that business and then brought Tim Cook in, who then took it to the next level. And again, it was a, the same thing I said earlier. It's about attracting the right people, having the depth of management. And when I met Tim, I mean, he's an incredibly talented individual, fantastic background. And Tim then took the business to the next level and actually led the management buyout. And he attracted Graphite, yeah. which was the same company that had brought Alexander Mann. Mm -hmm. And they ended up acquiring Engage, uh, which was a fantastic journey for Tim and great for me as an exit. So the second time you do that, and then, Ham then Hamilton Bradshaw comes into play, which is the your own PE firm then. A final interruption to today's episode to introduce Vincere. Vincere is the all-in-one CRM ATS platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry. Now, I first heard about these guys about a year ago. The amount of prospect recruitment agencies and clients I was working with that were telling me they were moving over to Vincere, I had to look into it. And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. But the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are, are doing this to give their their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 Crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. How did Dragon's Den come alive? Is that was it around that time that you you got onto the show? Yeah, I um I had literally got a call out of the blue from the BBC because they had Peter Jones, who's a technology entrepreneur, and Deborah, who does on you know the environment, and Theo, who does retail. But they didn't actually have a venture capitalist, somebody who actually does this every day. And they reached out to me and said, look, we'd like to have somebody on the show that it's a kind of a proper serial investor from a private equity background. You do Hamilton Bradshaw, invest in people. We think that could be a really good fit. And I kind of smiled because I thought, what do I know about TV? I'm just a recruitment guy. I mean, you know, I've been running a recruitment business. So TV was something that had never even crossed my mind. Um, but I knew the show and I loved the show. Um, but I wasn't really sure that that would really be for me. Uh, so I said, is there, you know, is there a chance I could come on and maybe do a trial day and just see, you know, if it works? And they said that we'd love to have you. Why don't you come to Pinewood Studios? You can do two or three days in the den, get to meet everybody else and interact with the entrepreneur. So I did three days and I had an absolute ball. I mean, it was just hilarious. It was so much fun. Some of the guys that came in and the ideas were just, you know, off the charts. And after three days, I said, look, I'd love to do it. I think this is, you know, just a lot of fun to do. Um, so I did my first series uh, and then I stayed for four years. I did four series. Oh. I think I made about 50 episodes. How um, much was that? Was it, was it one of those things you did a few episodes in one day or once a week? How did you? How did you no, no, no. You, so basically you arrive at uh, Pinewood 
and you film the entire series in one go. Oh, wow. So you literally film for, I think it's eight weeks straight. So you arrive at nine, you finish at six, and you're just in the den every day. And one thing you'll notice if you watch the show is for an entire series, everybody wears the same clothes. So when, um, when I started my filming, I was really excited because I thought, what a great excuse to buy a new wardrobe. I thought, I'm going to go and buy some super cool suits. And the wardrobe department called and said, no, 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 you just need the one. I said, surely not. Surely I'm not going to wear one suit for like 13 episodes. And they, they said, exactly, that's what we do. I said, how does that work? And they said, basically, you just sit in the studio for eight weeks straight. You see lots of people and we just edit. You know, so we might take an entrepreneur for week seven, week one, week three yeah. to create one episode. But we can't have one episode with you having four different outfits. No. So if you if you, if you don't wear the same, we can't edit the way we want. Um, so I thought, oh, I get it, understand it. So every year you kind of blocked out kind of eight weeks of filming. So you literally, I think you start in April, you finish at the end of May, and then you don't hear from them <coughs> for about four months when they're editing the series. And then you get a call in September saying, you know, we're transmitting in whichever month and, and the show appears um, on the BBC. And how did that change your life, being involved in that? Um, I mean, prior to Dragon's Den, you know, I was just like any other individual entrepreneur, you know, running a business, doing my thing. To all of a sudden, you're on a national TV show, which in itself is a bit of an iconic show that everybody loves. Yeah. And, you know, where you're in a shopping center, somebody will stop you. You're in a restaurant, somebody will ask you for a selfie. Uh, all of a sudden, you find that, you know, you might have got 50 emails a day, which become 500 emails a day. And it does. It, it literally does change your life. You, you, you know, and for somebody who'd never thought about it, that never even considered it, you know, once the show went live, I just found it strange, you know, walking into, you know, a restaurant or walking out and just people knowing who you were it just seemed really strange. Yeah, for sure. And it, like I say, it didn't, it did, I don't think it necessarily explained where you made your money. It just said like, you know, private equity tycoon, James Kahn. So you, again, no one know. there's a disconnect between what you actually do daily and what you're doing on TV. People just know you're, you know, you've got the money to, to invest. What, how did that impact the business? Did it? Did you see that as a result of going on that show, obviously taking away the transactions you made in, through the show and you invested in, in, in organizations, did it, did it clearly have an impact on your ability to attract those, those investments through Hamilton Bradshaw? I mean, when I started on Dragon's Den, we had, there was me, an analyst and a PA. So it was just the three of us mm. um, because nobody knew me in private equity. So, you know, setting up Hamilton Bradshaw was like a startup. I mean, we literally had to pick up the phone every single day, go out, find deals, build relationships because nobody knew you. And one of the biggest challenges we had was how do you find new deals, you know, in a business that nobody knows. And the only thing that I'd ever done in my career was recruitment. Um, so I didn't really bring a lot to the private equity world. So obviously, you can imagine doing Dragon's Den transformed that. So all of a sudden, it catapulted me into a position where people from all over the country who had deals thought, you know, actually, I think I'll call James because I think he might be interested in that. So you can imagine deal flow just skyrocketed. And Hamilton Bradshaw, which was literally in a serviced office with three people, we moved to offices in Mayfair in Grosvenor Street. And we had we'd grown to a team of 47 people, which in private equity terms is a big business. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was very big. Uh, and that was purely down to the den. That was purely down to um, just the exposure that national TV can give you. Sounds incredible. Was there any downsides to it? Obviously, the volume of emails and probably having to learn how to let people down gracefully on, a, on, a, on an automated basis. But... What was, was there any negatives attached to being in the public eye, I maybe mean, being in newspapers or whatever? I mean, I think 
because it was never something that I'd ever thought of doing. It didn't, you know, like lots of people maybe study or plan to have a TV career and it's who they are and it's their background, etc. Because also it came to me at a, at a later stage of life. And, you know, it, it can become quite intrusive. You know, you're out with your family or, you know, you're, you're in a restaurant, you know, with your daughter and people are constantly approaching you or, you know, can I have a selfie, can I have an autograph, etc. You do find, and, and, you know, if you make a comment, you know, prior to the show, if I'd made a comment, it would make no difference. Mm. All of a sudden now, if I share an opinion about something, um, you know, it's bound to make the papers the following day. So, you know, I think it is a different experience to what I'd been used to. Um, but, you know, it was fun and I enjoyed it and I have no regrets. No, I thought, I mean, everyone, everyone loves it. I, I was reading, I think, an art, I don't know if it was an image, an infographic the other day on LinkedIn about the brands that were, were knocked back on Dragon's Den. And I think Brewdog was one that was 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 told no on Dragon. I mean, and they've what an amazing brand they've created. It is, it is insane to think some of the companies they, that you guys did invest in and some that you said no to. Um, so but let me so just give you an like, example of that. So if you take that, um, people say that to me all the time. So if I, if I, if you imagine, Sean, if I introduce you to somebody and say, so sit down, close your eyes, I'm going to introduce you to a guy, there's somebody you've never met before with an idea that you know nothing about, open your eyes, I'll give you 20 minutes to make a decision to part with 100 grand. Let me see how easy you think it would be to do that. So, yeah. you know, when, when you sit there, like most people, so, you know, I'm, in, I'm already an investor. So if somebody comes to me, I meet them, they've got an idea, they give me a business plan, you know, I meet them the second time, I get to know the person, I do a bit of research about the market, the sector, you talk to a few people you know, and, you know, within a four to six week period, which is quite normal, you kind of decide this is something I want to do. Now you take that and you put yourself in the den where you've got six cameras, five million people watching you, give you 20 minutes to make a decision on a sector you know nothing about, so wow. I'm in recruitment. What do I know about brewing? Hmm. You know, I know nothing. What is the market, the sector? What are the margins? How does it work? You know, how, you know, what's the distribution? What's the cost of raw materials? I know nothing. So to be able to make that decision in 20 minutes is really hard. So I remember walking into the den thinking, oh, this is easy. I could do this. I do this every day. Well, of course, it's easy in a sector I've spent my life in. But how many investments did I make in recruitment? None. So, you you know, you had Trunky or, a, you know, a spicy sauce or a brewing company or whatever. So yeah. it's really hard to make a decision. And remember, this is not the BBC's money. And it doesn't matter how successful you are. £100,000, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of money that you're blowing in 20 minutes for something that literally could go nowhere. And did you... Did you have any successful or horror stories off the back of the show from things you did invest in? Um, so I invested in 14, I mean, 14 investments. Um, the one that actually did well that I was quite surprised at because I, I took a lot of flack from the press on it. I invested in a lady called Sammy French who invented a, a treadmill for dogs. Right. Uh, she thought dogs were just getting too fat in England and we were a bit lazy in taking the dog for a walk. And, you know, why do humans have treadmills? Why can't dogs have one? And I just thought it was such a cool idea. I just thought it was super cool. So I invested 100000 uh, in a treadmill for a dog. And that actually did better than I thought. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I also did another one called Chockbox, which was like an electrical device, uh, which was one of the most successful ones on the show. It did really, really well. You know, so like all these things, some you do that did better than you think. Yeah. And others just tanked. So would, would they become part of Hamilton Bradshaw's portfolio then if they, if they you were, yeah. 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 And Hamilton Bradshaw has, has got a mixed portfolio of different industries. And then your latest venture, Recruitment Entrepreneur, is, is what it says on the tin. It's all about recruitment businesses, right? Yes. Yeah, so and now sort of I've done a complete U-turn after 30 years in the business. Now I don't I tend not to invest in anything else mm -hmm. because, you know, I've learned from 30 years of experience now that, to be successful, it makes a huge difference if you actually know the sector you're investing in. You know, so I've probably done 53 investments in my career now. And 
you can pretty much easily work out the ones that do well. It's the one that you understand better. So mm -hmm. if I'd have invested in Brewdog, what do I really bring to the table other than the capital? Nothing. No. But if I invest in a recruitment business, I bring so much experience and knowledge and know-how and war stories and things that I did well and things that failed, you can make a difference. But in a business where you have nothing to add, you can't really influence and make a difference. So typically now, if I make an investment, I tend to stick to what I know because all of the investments that I made in markets I knew nothing about, surprise, surprise, didn't do as well as I thought. Yeah, yeah. We we met, it was 2018 when I hosted that event with you guys in Manchester. Uh, at the time, lived in London. Now I live about five minutes walk from that, that event in, in Manchester City. <laughs> um, and as I said, I thought it was a fascinating conversation listening to your story that day. What I think at the time you were about 15 in the portfolio, potentially maybe a bit less. How has how has a recruitment entrepreneur grown over the last few years? And how, tell us a bit more about that business. Um, so I think we've got about twenty four businesses in the portfolio now. Um, and if I'm honest, it's done way better than I thought. Really? Um, we've attracted some amazing individuals, and I think the formula is a, a marriage made in heaven, because effectively you have somebody who's in recruitment you know, who has an ambition that he wants to have his own business. But most importantly, he doesn't want a boutique. He wants to have a proper business of scale. He wants to build a brand and he wants to build something that's a market leader. And typically the entrepreneur, what does he really bring? He brings knowledge of recruitment, but he's never run a business before. He's never scaled a business before. He's probably not been in that position where he's taken the ultimate decisions because he's worked for a corporate. So he comes to recruit an entrepreneur and we have all of the kind of entrepreneurial background experience and knowledge. He has the passion of the market and the sector. And when you bring the two together, you can see it just, it just works because he arrives and literally day one, you know, we have 20 offices around the country. He can pick any location he wants. We can set him up in an office. We have technology. We have back office. We have finance. We have, you know, kind of client acquisition, branding, marketing, website. So he literally has access to all of that, you know, which took me 17 years to create at Alexander Man. Imagine if I could have started Alexander Man, you know, within Recruitment Entrepreneur. Alexander Man took me 17 years. You know, I could have done it in 10. Mm. You know, it just makes a huge difference. But then, you know, the question you ask yourself, you know, um, did I have any mentors? And the only mentor I had was my dad. You know, if you join Recruitment Entrepreneur, you have 25 mentors of people in the same industry as yourself in different markets and sectors. You know, you've got 25 mentors of other entrepreneurs, you know, in the same situation as yourself. Yeah. But it's your yeah. business. You run the business. You're the CEO. You make the decisions. You've got this infrastructure, this ecosystem that's been built around you to help scale it. And, you know, we're not, we don't, we're not embarrassed, you know, we, we've invested a huge amount, millions of pounds in that, you know, and we make money too, you know, it's a win-win partnership. We take the investment risk, the entrepreneur comes along, we share in the equity, and together we build and scale the business with a view of you having a very comfortable lifestyle along the journey, with a view that you're working with somebody who has successfully exited probably more businesses than anyone else in the recruitment industry in the UK. And what, what are you looking for from what, what makes an investable? I mean, I, I look at myself back in 2016, I was a, you know, 700,000 pound biller. I was built, I was building a contract team. I, I was going to start my own business. I didn't really know. I'd never been privy to those decision-making conversations. Like you said, at, at the top, there was about 50, I think it was 52 people in our business when I left and I managed about 20 of them. Um, I, I, I couldn't talk to anyone because the only recruitment owners I knew were my bosses. So I was very, I was, I was quite stuck in, in my mindset and I was quite institutionalized as well. I only really knew what I knew from the brand I'd worked for. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I would have been a good investment back then or not. I think I was probably, I don't know, looking back, I, 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 I didn't know whether I wanted to scale or wanted a boutique. I didn't, I was lost, I think. But what... I'm trying to, I'm trying to put myself. I'm sure I'm someone that would have that conversation. 
But what, what's the ideal fit for you? What type of people make the best investments in your opinion? I mean, so I think it's important that if we're trying to create a business which is something of scale, then we look for somebody who's a leader. You know, can this person lead a business? Can he lead people? Is he inspirational or is he just a manager? You know, mm -hmm. is he just a biller? So if you're just a biller, you probably don't need us because as a biller in a boutique business, you can probably do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I met somebody and that's what my observation was, I'd be really open and honest and say, I think you've got a great idea. It sounds really achievable, but you can do this yourself because what you really want is a lifestyle business, in which case you don't need a partner. It could be that if you really demonstrate to me that you're really looking to build a brand, something scalable of size, then I know that's way harder to do. It takes a lot longer. You need more capital. You need more investment. You need infrastructure. You need to build a brand. You need to create a market leader. That doesn't happen with your limited experience as a big biller. For that, mm -hmm. you need proper people around you who can help achieve that. You know, every entrepreneur I meet talks about having an exit, but, you know, less than 1% of the businesses in the UK in recruitment will ever see an exit. You know, it's all theoretical because to create an exit, you know, it's not just about your billings or your profit or your turnover. It's about the infrastructure, your back office, your finance, your compliance, your governance, your branding, your management team, you know, the the share of the equity within the management team. You know, the business has to be of size, of scale. And when somebody's investing in that business, they're not just looking at what you've done. What they need to believe is where are you going and how can you demonstrate that the business will continue to grow and build, you know, past yourself. So most people that I see today to create that is not easy. And I think for that, you, you need a partner, somebody who's been there, done it before, understands it, because I think 99% of entrepreneurs who set up in recruitment probably won't get to that position because it's super hard to achieve. And the vision for your portfolio in, in that business is, is it a group sale of the whole thing at, at some point or are people able to exit their own individual brands within so the I think We have three strategies. So, you know, literally two weeks ago, I got approached by somebody in the US uh, who's interested in one of the businesses that we've invested in. Uh, happens to be complementary to the market they operate in. They're already in the same sector in the US. They're quite big, and they are effectively expanding into the UK market. Want to acquire something that's in that space? So there's an opportunity for my founder to exit as a standalone business to a larger US business to give him that international reach. So that could be done as an individual brand. We've then got kind of phase two where we cluster five or six businesses that we have in one market. So it could be finance and accounting. So today we have eight businesses in insurance, financial services, investment banking, actuarial, accountancy. So we could create a professional services portfolio of eight businesses, create one cluster, and we could create a, an exit event for that cluster. And then the third strategy is we could actually exit the whole as a flotation, as a public company on the on the stock market. So I think we're going to effectively follow all three strategies. You know, along the way, I think there'll be opportunities for founders to exit the standalones. I think we'll also have clusters that we will exit. And I also think longer term, you know, we could actually float the entire company on the market. I love that. It's exciting. Have you got a timeline in your, in your mind of when you would like to potentially... Um, I think I think transactions I think will happen this year. So I think we'll probably do one or two sales this year. You know, I think the cluster probably within the next twenty four months. I think we'll have a cluster exit, and I think you know, a flotation of the whole could be a five to seven year time horizon. So what's important to me is we're not betting the farm on one strategy. It's kind of all or nothing. You know, we've got a journey. And along that journey, there are opportunities for realizations all the way through the process. 
You must love this stuff because you don't need to do it, right? You, you, you told me at 42 years old, you could have just sat on a beach for the rest of your life. What What is driving you every day, James? Like, Why are you still putting yourself through this? Because <laughs> um, I, I suppose I'm lucky enough where I've had the opportunity um, where, you know, I, I live in Monaco today, I live by the sea, um, you know, so I don't have to work every day. Um, I do, you know, I have a, a good kind of quality of life. But I've, I recognize that you can't just sit on the beach every day. You can't play golf every day. Um, you need something that engages you, something which intellectually stimulates you. And you want to be interactive with other people. So, mm. you know, I don't clearly work as hard as I used to. You know, I was the kind of maverick entrepreneur, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't do that anymore. But you're right. You know, I love the business. I love the recruitment industry. It's what I've done all my life. I'm super passionate about it. And, you know, to this day, it, you know, I get a kick every morning when I wake up and I'm meeting a new entrepreneur with a vision, an idea to start a business and watching entrepreneurs grow, watching entrepreneurs evolve into successful businesses gives me a huge sense of satisfaction and motivation. I bet. In terms of the impact of COVID a year ago on your on your portfolio, how did that change then? Did you did you did you have to get closer? Did you have to did you find yourself in more conversations and stepping back into that leader? Because I mean, I had a very much small smaller business, but I felt like you know there were certain conversations I wasn't privy to, but I was in everything at that point. What was it like for you? I mean, I think in a way, I think we all had to grow up very quickly because we all found ourselves facing decisions we've never made before. You know, we literally woke up in March, you know, to a global lockdown where, you know, the, the whole world economy had stopped. Now, when did we ever experience that before? So, and, and forget about people I've invested in. Even for me, it was, it was daunting. Like, what are we going to do? So, you know, for the last 12 months, I've definitely become much more hands-on, much more involved with the business because we're having to make decisions we've never made before, you know, and challenges we've never faced before. You know, whether or not we go back to the office, you know, to, to better run a business working from home for the last year has been incredibly challenging. So, you know, I think, I suppose, like any entrepreneur, when you have to step back in the saddle, you know, the life of an entrepreneur is not nine to five. You know, it is a 24-7 existence. I'm lucky that today I've got an exceptional team of people around me. Um, you know, some of these guys have been with me, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, and I think it's because of the strength of the management team, I'm able to do what I can do because without them, the business would never function the way it does. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. We're, look, we're, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you a couple of, couple more things. And we mentioned it in the, when we had a pre-chat last week about the impact of LinkedIn on your brand. And I think you're the most followed person in our sector with 3 million followers and followers on LinkedIn. But this, I, I went from being a recruiter in 2016 who did everything in, in coffee shops and beers and lunches to building a marketing agency. I've never even worked in marketing for our sector by putting my face out there on LinkedIn. I was producing video before most people, some of them are awful, but we don't, we won't show them today. Um, but you know, I truly have built my business on LinkedIn. I've put everything out there, good and bad, and sometimes it's it's not been easy, but you know it's it's paid off hugely. Um, what made you get involved so heavily in LinkedIn a few years ago, and and what impact has that had for you? Um, I got involved because I realised and accepted that LinkedIn is here to stay. Um, mm. You know, it's become such a critical tool for our industry that if you don't embrace it you know, you are going to miss out because today, whether we like it or not, you know, it plays a significant role in the sector. And for somebody who has been so wedded to the recruitment industry as I have, not embracing it was not an option. Um, the thing that I found quite daunting is just because you're well known doesn't mean you attract followers. Mm -hmm. You know, I just assumed that because of who I was, it would be easy. Um, but it wasn't because the only reason you get followers if you produce good content. And if you don't produce good content, you get no traffic. And, you know, so and generating content 
day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, is not easy. No. Because, you know, you do, your brain goes a bit dry because, you know, to, 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 to constantly originate original content and it's just not easy. And along the journey, you know, I've hired lots and lots of different people um, but fundamentally realize that it's your voice, it's your, you know, it's your brand and, and it needs you, you know, to, to translate your, your kind of ideas, et cetera. Um, so the first thing I'd say, it's really hard. It's way harder than I thought. And, you know, to be that innovative and creative as consistently as you have to be is not easy. You can't just simply outsource it to a marketing agency. You have to be involved yourself because they are, you know, they're echoing your voice. And therefore, you have to be part of that process. So I, I kind of got on board on the basis that I thought if, if this is going to be such a big part of a sector that I'm so committed to, I need to understand it. And I need to embrace it and I need to develop a brand and a following. And again, like everything, when I first started, I didn't think, you know, I'd become the most followed person in the world on LinkedIn and recruitment. I thought, you know, could I get 10,000 followers? Could I get 20,000? Could I get 50,000? And I remember at the time, David Cameron, who was the prime minister, had 350,000. So he was my kind of benchmark. I thought if I could get close to... Cameron, that I know I'm on the right track. And then by the time he stepped down, he was at 700,000 and I got to like a million. And then I was following Obama and Obama had 1.6 million. Um, so I kind of targeted him. So I thought that's my next goal. And when he stepped down, he was at I think 2.4 million and I got to 2.9 million. Um, so, you know, just like a lot of people, I kind of set myself goals and targets etc and i think i'm at 300 or 3.2 million now so i think i'm ranked number seven in the world across every sector wow. um in terms of the most followed person you still have the app on your phone or would it just be annoying now uh, it'd be very annoying <laughs> so you know, i mean i literally you know i was up yesterday on a sunday you know it's about 45 minutes because they just recently launched a new functionality which is where you can do a poll mm -hmm. and you know i did a poll last week where i was curious to see what people thought about um going back to work and whether you know should the employer pick up the cost or you know should be your own cost i was interested in people's views and it was amazing over the weekend half a million people viewed that post um it was incredible just the you know the engagement and i think the other thing that i've realized that social media is not about the number of followers you have it's the quality of the engagement you know what you need is people to engage with you so so actually you build a following a real following and so the thing that i constantly do when i'm building that brand is measure that based on the engagement that i have with the people who follow me that's what it's about i mean i i personally created the our academy business last in the lockdown because we had only a marketing agency that was working with brands and so many people were like, you know, I'm not going to pay for a marketing agency right now. Anyway, I need, but I need to be visible. So we created an eight, a program at the time. It was 16 weeks. We've now whittled it down to eight weeks where we coach recruitment owners who'd perhaps furloughed all their teams on how they could be more visible and start doing the things that I'd done. And, and we had 165 agencies go through that between April and December. And now we've had over 3000 actual recruiters do it. And, I've got a process which I follow, which I think does churn out consistent, interesting, creative stuff. Um, but it is based on documentation of what you're already doing. It's not like, you know, sitting there coming up with weird and wonderful ideas. It's about taking those conversations you have on the phone and and taking them to the to the to the platform um and, and releasing little bits of your life as well. Um so it's good to see you, you know, you believe in this stuff, you're an advocate of it as well. Um James. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. I think in terms of some of the comments, uh, a lady called Julie West, who, who we've worked with, wrote, um, James, your love for the business shines through, which I thought was really nice. Um, Lyndall wrote, uh, business growth is is led by relationships, which is which is true. Thomas Woodhams has asked a question to both of us, but I'll, I'll let you answer this. I think it's we've probably answered it already, but Thomas asked, what makes a successful agency and why? So I think it's a, 
a simple but effective way to finish the show? Um, I think we're only as good as the people we have. And our agency is represented by the people we employ. And I think the success of our brand and our business is echoed with our people. So I go back to, to the point we made earlier. We're only as good as the people. And I think, you know, our aspirations and aims to attract the best that we can for the brand that we build is the key driver to success. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's like you said before, if we put half the time into it, recruiting for ourselves as we do for others, we'd, we'd be pretty good. Well, time, time is up because you've got other calls to make. But <laughs> James, thank you. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Um, We'll, um, I'm sure you'll get inundated with messages and people that have listened to this back on the show. If anyone does want to talk to you about Recruitment Entrepreneur or Hamilton Bradshaw, what's the best route to, to, to get through to the business? Um, so if you just simply go on to the Recruitment Entrepreneur website um, or just reach out to me on LinkedIn um, or just send me an email to jc at hamiltonbradshawhbpe.com. That's H-B. jchbpe.com. Very simple, very easy for people to follow. All right, James, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, guys, if you've enjoyed today's show, I always say thank you so much for listening and giving us your attention. If you enjoyed today's show, please don't keep it to yourself. You know, we're all connected to recruiters, to other recruitment owners. Um, please copy this message, uh, sorry, this episode and share it via text, WhatsApp, email, whichever way you can. Um, we might, you know, across the sector, across the world, we might have a uh, competition, but I firmly believe, and I'm sure James does, that together, if we learn from one another, we, as a sector, we will be stronger um, throughout whatever happens in the future. So thank you so much. I'll be back again very, very soon with another episode of The Rag. In the meantime, you stay safe and I'll see you soon.